All eyes were on Tallahassee as FAMU head coach James Cozy coaches in his first ever orange and green spring game. And I have three takeaways from the affair. Oh, yeah, it's locked on HBCU. Play my music. You are locked on HBCU, your daily podcast covering HBCU sports. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What's going on, family? Welcome back to another episode of the Locked On HBCU Podcast, your number one daily one-stop shop for everything HBCU athletics, Monday through Friday, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. And I, of course, am Darian Gray, a.k.a. the Mouth of the South, Texas Southern alum and former TSU Herald Sports editor and current contributing writer at USA Today's Saints Wire. Thank you for going on this journey with me. Make a Locked On HBCU your first listen of the day every day. And remember, just because the mic cuts off does not mean that the journey is over. It just means it's time to follow me on Twitter at South Exclusive. Starts with an S and ends with an S. Today's episode is brought to you by Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use the code Locked On College to get twenty dollars off your first purchase. We have a bit of a FAMU sandwich for today's show. We wrap up today's episode with a look at the odds at who will be FAMU's new men's basketball head coach. My everydayers may remember that we had to make a quick, a quick audible after Angel Jackson was selected by the Las Vegas Aces in the WNBA draft. And that wrapped up our episode yesterday. So that pushed segment three into today. So we'll wrap up with that prior to it. We'll be looking at the transfer portal because on Monday you have the third transfer portal session window, however you want to phrase it. It opened up and it goes until the end of the month. I just feel like this transfer portal session doesn't get its just due when we talk about the praise and the value it can have to your university. But let's kick it off with fam you spring game. James Cozy's first ever orange and green spring game. And I think a lot of eyes were on Tallahassee because one of the biggest questions, if not the biggest question in HBCU football going into 2024 is what will fam you look like without Willie Simmons? And I think I may do a segment after this portal session. So probably in the beginning of May of what continuity really looks like for fam you and that that word. I think that's a real big buzzword with the Rattlers. I may look at that. But as of right now, we're going to operate with what we know we have. Everything else will be settled, settled in the next couple of weeks. But we'll go with what we know we have. And my biggest takeaway is they have the offensive skill players to support a quarterback. You need the offensive line to do it as well. But when you hear about the talking points around the, the spring game, I hear a lot about the talent, right? And I think that's important because that was Willie Simmons' bread and butter. Let's kick it off with the wide receivers. I think it's important to... Make sure that you show your wide receiver success can extend beyond Willie Simmons because that's a big thing. He was an offensive coach. So now that James Cozy comes in, will they be able to have the same offensive success? If you judge based off of Cozy's post spring game presser, there's a lot of belief in the talent there. And you have a guy like Jamari Gassett who they recruited early, right? Or, or young, I should say. Then you had a guy like Kareem Burke who he opted out. They recruited him young as well, but he went ahead and hit the transfer portal. The reason I bring up both of those guys, even though one is on the team, is because you want to show people that you don't need to leave like Kamari Burke did. Matter of fact, if you're not there, you can go ahead and come in because we know how to produce talent. You had Xavier Smith. You had John Ray Cherie. When Smith left, you brought in Marcus Riley, and he looked good with you. I, I just personally feel like you've seen a heavy emphasis on reclaiming local talent. Recruiting is already localized, but it does feel as if when you get into the transfer portal, all of those local rules go out of the window. I could be wrong, but when it comes to FAMU, I feel like I've seen them recruit a lot of Florida talent that had already went to schools, and it's a lot of homecoming 
type of conversations. And that's kind of what I feel like they went to school in an area. Maybe it was Florida State. Look at a guy like Rodney Hill, a guy like Demory Tate. Maybe it was just uh, I think I've seen some USF. I think I've seen some Central Florida. Right? I, you just see these guys who are coming home, but they were in the transfer portal. And I feel like I see that with FAMU more often and maybe even more than I see with other schools. And one thing that Florida knows how to do is they know how to produce wide receivers. It may be a herky-jerky style, right? They know how to put good wide receivers into the NFL. They want to put good wide receivers into the uh, the college game. I just think it's their style of play that makes them kind of unique. And I was talking to a friend of mine. He said, hey, you know a Florida receiver when you see a Florida receiver. You know a Florida player when you see a Florida player because they have a certain aesthetic, a certain style. So if the Rack Boys are going to continue, there is no more Sharif. There's no more Riley. There's no more Smith. But they do have Gasset. They do have a guy in, in uh, Ja'Cory Jordan who is moving over from quarterback, and they say that his his athleticism is making this a quick uh, transition for him. If they can show that they can continue to put wide receivers on the field, they'll continue to get wide receivers. And after you do it after, you know, maybe two, three, four, five years, now it becomes a fam, you produces wide receivers. I want to go there. And I think that they're teetering around that spot. You had Smith for years. You had Sharif for a couple of years. You had Riley for a year. So at least in these last three years, it's been very prominent. And you had Smith before that because Smith was doing it when he was in the MEAC. So they, they have a lot of talent on at this position, and I want to see if they can continue doing it. But let's go through these next two a little bit quicker, and they're both on the defensive side of the ball. The other big takeaway is look for them to be very aggressive in filling defensive line holes in the transfer portal, probably just the defense in general, but he's speaking, he being cozy, he's speaking to guys who are in the transfer portal. And they're talking about how they just want to know what the other side has to offer. And he's always open to them returning. Here's the thing, though. You have to make sure that you walk that line between wanting to bring your players back, making sure that they, they know they have a home, but then you don't want to wait on them. Right. Like, I understand you probably really want Gentle Hunt back. You probably really want Anthony Dunn back. But are you going to be hesitant to get a defensive tackle, to get a defensive end, because you want to make sure that you have room for those guys just in case? I don't think that's the way to go. Make room. I feel like you can make room for a Dunn. You can make room for a Hunt if you need to. But the point is, Cozy himself said they've been hit really hard at the defensive line in the transfer portal. So expect for them to go into the transfer portal to fill that out. The portal is all, I haven't got to that segment yet. I almost said it, but this, I have not gotten to that segment yet. But this is a perfect example of why the transfer portal is all about plugging holes and the value that it provides to you, this specific session of the transfer portal. And then we wrap up with, hey, the secondary is going to be the strength of this defense. I think that's crystal clear. Um, maybe it's because Cozy himself was a defensive back, but I think a lot of it has to do with the experience in the room. This is the room that returns a guy that you really wanted to come back. Dunn and Hunt were probably those guys along the defensive line. Johnny Chaney was that guy in the second level at the linebacker position, but you have a guy like Kendall Bowler. And if we're not speaking about returns, you have a high profile transfer portal guy in Demory Tate. So the secondary has a certain edge on the rest of the defense. And you got a couple of interceptions. So you, you saw them show out in that who was being that's who was being spoken about when you look at the defense. Naturally, you have a guy like Bowler, you have a guy like Tate. They like Andre Powell, who was a backup last year, but was a part of the team. And, and, and you like a guy like Gibson Battle. Like, these are guys who, for me, for me, I, I'm i used to the defensive line and the front seven being the ones that I'm looking at because Isaiah Land won the Buck Buchanan Award when Marcus Bell was in his last year. Then Isaiah Land came back, and I was looking at Isaiah Major. Last year, I was looking at Major. I was looking at Hunt. Like, I'm used to looking at the front seven. But that defensive backfield, I think, is going to be what really defines the team. And they work hand in hand with the defensive line. The longer you can cover, the better pressure is because you're allowed more time to get there. So I think that overall, know the 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 
identity of the team isn't going to be what I thought it was over the last three years. But that doesn't mean anything as far as quality. That's just about how you'll be looking at this at the team the next season, the fall. That'll be what really tells us whether or not this is a quality defense. But expect for the secondary to be the strong suit. Now, as we push, as we push forward, excuse me, let's get into the transfer portal. My mind has been on the transfer portal since I started speaking about FAMU and how they're going in the field holes. So I'm looking at this, and I want to break that down some more as we continue with Locked On HBCU. Today's episode is brought to you by Monopoly Go. And listen, people love to tell me that I'm competitive. It really depends on who you talk to. I'm either very competitive or I'm not competitive at all. It's the funniest little, you know, halfway or whatever. But Monopoly Go really does allow me to really tap into my competitive side. A friend of mine said I love playing with friends and family. That's cool. I like beating friends and family. I'm just going to be honest with you. I like playing with him, too, because I want to win. And I, I can't wait to get my brother on this game because he's a big Monopoly head. And I can't beat him in real Monopoly when you got to roll the dice. But I can get him in Monopoly Go because I can have the typical charge rent on my iconic uh, properties. But I can also rob their vaults for riches of my own. So when he's out here and I'm landing on his square and he keeps taxing me, that's cool. I'm going to get my money back. You, you know what? I, I would just tell you to go play the game for yourself. That's the best way for me to really tell you to understand. Download Monopoly Go. It's free. You can get on the App Store, the Google Play, wherever you want to go look for uh, games at. You can find Monopoly Go. Go ahead and have yourself a good time. As we continue rolling with today's episode of Locked on HBCU, I appreciate you for making this your first listen of the day every day for your second listen. Make sure you're checking out Locked on Sports Today's 24-7 uh, streaming channel because at 6 p.m. Central today, 6 p.m. Central today, you will have the Locked on NFL mock draft. You have the local experts from each team, and they'll be breaking down who your squad should be selecting in this year's NFL draft. It's only a week away. Now, I want to continue pushing looking at the transfer portal because this transfer portal session to me is one of, no, this transfer portal is the most underrated session in the transfer portal discussions because, and I think there's two reasons for that. One, there's no real fanfare. It just feels kind of random. When you look at what they put around the first session, you have early signing day. That's kind of like it builds up into something. When you look at the second session, you, and I don't even know if there's those are two separate sessions, but to me, there's a checkpoint in between them. So I kind of separate them. So you have the early transfers. Actually, I, I, like I said, I don't know if it's a different window, but you have the check when transfers are able to come in and play in a spring game. And you have those who can't, right? Because if you sign on National Signing Day, you're not coming in in the spring more times than not. So you have the first window of the transfer portal. When you have early signing day, it builds into that. The second window, it builds into national signing day. And with that, that's when we really look back on your recruiting class. When people say, hey, this recruiting class was really good, they're looking at everything before the first week in February. Once you get into April, which is where we are now, nobody Nobody really cares. Like, like nobody is looking for that a lot of times. That's not the, the conversation on how we shape what your recruiting class was or if we like it or not. But this is just as valuable. It's just underrated because there's nothing. April 15th, April 15th, April 30th, and that's it. It just – it doesn't stop. It's just there. This isn't a signing day situation. So there is no checkpoints, but – in the midst of your, and it's in the midst of your spring season, right? Like, it's just, this is not the main focus. If you haven't already had your spring game, your spring game will be the main focus, not this. So I, I just, I just feel like those things really do come into play. But the second reason that it's underrated is because this isn't where you really get your stars at. You may be able to get a quarterback. Alabama State, I think, Two years ago now at this point, Alabama State got D. Davis in the spring session. In hindsight, not the biggest move, but at 
the time, this was a big deal. You got your starting quarterback. This is who you thought was going to be the leader of your university over the next couple of years. You won't be able to get that at most positions. You probably won't get a a a wide receiver that excites you. You're like, oh man, I got a number one. Quarterbacks are different because quarterbacks go through the spring and say, I can't compete in my current situation. I thought I might be able to, but I'm not going to because it's only one of us. And don't let me be number three. Yeah, I got to go. That's what happened with D. Davis. That's not going to happen with every position. Wide receivers aren't going to say, yeah, I'm planning to see if I can make it right. Because let's, okay. Getting quarterback three from Auburn is way more exciting than getting wide receiver six. Let's put it that way. It's way more exciting. So because you're not getting stars here, and that happens in your earlier sessions, people really don't care. There's no, oh, wow, we got this guy. That's a rarity. That is a rarity. At the FCS level, our stars leave in this session, but we don't typically get people we feel like are stars in return. So, And I think that's why it goes underrated. But let me tell you why you can't undervalue it. Because you look at James Cozy. Anthony Dunn has hit the portal. Gentle Hunt has hit the portal. Um, Johnny Chaney is in the portal. Uh, but let's keep it at Hunt and let's keep it at Dunn. You've seen the impact of their absence on the defensive line. So now I know I need to attack that defensive line. I need to be able to fill it with bodies. right? It, it may not be superstardom, but I need to fill it with bodies. That's the most important thing. And it's something that gets overlooked on a consistent basis, but you need depth. You could have a great pass rushing duo coming off the edges, but guess what? Even if you had Reggie White and Lawrence Taylor, let's throw Aaron Donald in the middle, right? Like, like let's just say you had all three of those players on, on your defensive line. You're going to need somebody else behind them. You can't just have great players in your starting lineup and then disregard the depth because injuries happen, fatigue happens, all of these things are real. So when I look at this third transfer portal, it's about filling out the roster, whether that's with depth, whether that's with, I gave you three defense alignment, you need a fourth to be your starter. He might not be a star. He's not going to be Donald. He's not going to be Randall. He's not going to be white. He's not going to be uh, um, um, who else does I say? He's not going to be Taylor, right? Like he's not going to be these things. But he can be a very serviceable starter, right? Like, that's important. Everybody's not a star. But you know what? Those role players really do come in to play a part. So I, I think that overall, when you look at the moving pieces, you have a better assumption of what your team is going to be. You don't know for certain, but you had three weeks of practice to be able to get a gauge on, I don't like that position group. That position group isn't what I thought it would be. This returning player who was a backup, but we thought could step into a bigger role, he doesn't look primed to be able to do it. So I need to go in and I need to get a new tight end. I need to go in and I need to get a new wide receiver, a new offensive lineman, right? Because T.C. Taylor just said, my offensive linemen are big, but they don't understand aggression. I need to go give me some aggressive offensive linemen then. Because now I have a grasp on what I feel about this particular group. I can go in and change some things about it. That's the way that I look at it. And I overall, people aren't going to look at April in summation. They're not going to look at April to see, well, who did you bring in? But those players that you bring in in April could quietly be the base of your team that you need to ensure that you push to a celebration bowl. So I appreciate you for checking that out. Now I want to push back to FAMU. Now, you know, I appreciate you for not, not checking out, but I appreciate you for listening to my rant. Cause this was a little bit of a rant. Right? Like, I appreciate that. Now let's push into a little bit of betting because you have odds. You have odds that I want to look at of who's going to be the next fam you head coach in men's basketball as we continue with today's episode of Locked On HBCU. Today's episode is brought to you by Yahoo Finance. And if you want to make sure that you're using your money correctly, Yahoo Finance is the way to go. Maybe you want a little bit of money on who's or you will win a little bit of money on who's going to be the next fam you head coach. So we'll make sure you use that money correctly. 
And wouldn't it be great if you could see all of your investment and retirement accounts in one place? With Yahoo Finance, you can consolidate your views from multiple accounts into one hub and access the expert analysis you need to tend to your entire portfolio. For example, maybe I have accounts with Schwab. I have a 401k with Fidelity and I've been using Yahoo Finance to consolidate them in one place, which has made it incredibly easy to manage. You know what? Let's just get to the point. Maybe you want to grow your portfolio to deal with the rising cost of inflation, to pay off your debt, your mortgage, pretty much anything standing in the way of you and financial freedom, right? So with Yahoo Finance, you can get access to news, data, tools that'll help you or that you need in order to help you reach that financial freedom. This is how I look at it. For a comprehensive financial news and analysis, view the brand behind every great investor. YahooFinance.com, the number one financial uh, destination. YahooFinance.com, that's YahooFinance.com. As we're wrapping up today's episode of Locked on HBCU, I appreciate you for making this your first listen of the day every day, making it all the way to segment three. And I thank you two times for that. Thank you. Thank you. I want to wrap this up with, excuse me, so I want to wrap this up with something that I'm really not typically used to looking at. And that's a little bit of betting on it. So Hoop Dirt is a website that is dedicated to college basketball. This is what they do. Shout out to them. Um, isn't it nice to have a specialty? But FAMU has been searching for their head coach for the last month. I think it was around March 20th, March 18th, somewhere around that range, that they fired their men's basketball head coach, and they just haven't been good. They just they just haven't. It, it was time to get a new regime change. For me, I'm still pushing for Chris Wright, the Langston head coach. I'm still pushing for him because I think that – his ability to turn Talladega around, turn Langston around, achieve quick success in everywhere that he's gone. He's been another school's first ever NAIA tournament or led another school to their first ever NAIA tournament. This is a guy who I feel like I'm picking up the phone to call to say, do you want to come on to FAMU? Wright is not one of the seven men that is listed. So that will put him in the plus 3,500 list, which is coaches not on the list. OK, so if I wanted to put money down on that, I could in my odds would be plus thirty five hundred. I want to go over the guys with the top three, though. You have Mike Davis at plus two seventy five. You have Kevin Nickelberry at plus three seventy five. And you have Will Jones at plus four twenty five. Now, I know Davis and Jones quite freaking well. Davis was the head coach at Texas Southern when I first got there. I was able to see him win a couple of championships. But then also. Will Jones was just on the show. So I know him as a person. I know Davis as I wasn't in media at the time. So I know Davis as a successful head coach that I never really paid attention to, to be honest. Like I wasn't in here. Oh, let me see what kind of coaching adjustments he's making. I was like, OK, TSU was winning that. That was my only concern at the time. But let's get into the guys. Kudos to Hoop Dirt because they understand how the HBCU coaching searches go. Five of the seven coaches that they brought up have HBCU experience. And I think that's important because we know that tends to be what most of our universities look for first. And I, I understand it, but that's just a, a funny thing to me, no matter how many times it happens. So five of those seven names are attached to HBCUs. One of the two that aren't is currently coaching in Florida, FAMU, the proximity. It They got it right on the right on the money. So I got to give Hoop Dirt um credit when it comes to that but mike davis is the first favorite and the most interesting right if you're speaking about success in the conference that you want to if you want to succeed in right so let's say fam you when they're looking at who they want as their next head men's basketball head coach maybe they're thinking i want somebody who clearly is a good coach right i think that's obvious when fam you is looking for their next men's basketball coach they obviously want somebody of quality, but we're looking at other traits that they may want. If you want success in the SWAC, if you want success, proven success in the conference that you're currently in, Mike Davis is not only the favorite in odds, he should be the favorite in your eyes because in his six years at Texas Southern, Davis won four regular season titles. He won four tournament titles and not a single year passed in which he didn't win one or the other. 
when you're speaking about success in the swag, this is all that Mike Davis knows, right? Like, I I was a I was a student at Texas Southern. I know what it's like to feel like every single home game is a W. I know what that's like. Mike Davis, he just got finished with the Detroit Mercy. He was let go after a struggle season there. But if you can bring him back somewhere where he had a lot of success, I don't know how much the SWAC landscape has changed and maybe the game is different over the last – he's been gone since 18, so I think that's like, what, six years? Um, 18, 19? Yeah, so maybe going on that. But overall, Mike Davis is a great choice if you want six, proven success. Mike Davis is a great choice if you want proven success in the SWAC. Then you have Nickelberry, who has experience in Howard and Hampton. And you have Will Jones, who has the most head coach, or excuse me, the most wins by a first-year North Carolina a t head coach. So he has experience with getting quick results. I think that overall, Nickelberry may be somebody you're familiar with because you played him at one point when he was with Hampton, but the regime is so far apart. I, I don't know if that's applicable. But Davis has the SWAC experience that you would covet and then will jones has that quick turnaround ability that you would also covet because you don't want to be as bad as you were a year ago so hopefully this episode is better than it was a year ago right that's that's the always the point be better than you were yesterday be better than you were a year ago if amu wants to do that will jones nickelberry and mike davis are currently the betting favorites to be able to achieve that goal i appreciate you for making this your first listen of the day every day on tomorrow's episode we got mo carter fox 54 coming in to speak about alabama a and m spring game because i got some questions that i need answered and i don't know how i feel about the quarterback play so let's break that down as we continue or excuse me on tomorrow's episode of locked on hbcu until next time we hear each other family Take care. Stay blessed. Peace.